You are listening to The Overwhelmed Brain. Today's episode is brought to you by GetOutOfTheMess.com. Let Asha, your Legal Shield associate, connect you to a legal insurance plan that's right for you. Get quality attorneys at established law firms for about $20 a month. Are you annoyed by affirmations? Are you tired of that same old, rehashed, personal growth advice that all seems to boil down to think positively and all your problems will go away. If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then I want you to get ready. The Overwhelmed Brain is here to help you create the life you want now. Welcome to the Overwhelmed Brain. I am your host, personal empowerment coach, Paul Coliani. I am here to help you increase your emotional intelligence, strengthen your self-worth and self-esteem, and empower you so that you can make decisions that are right for you. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult your physician, your doctor, your therapist, whoever you consult before making any changes to your treatment of yourself. And I just want to let you know that it's really good to be on the microphone in the middle of New Hampshire. I am on vacation with my family, my girlfriend and her son, and uh, we are visiting family. So I am right now in a makeshift studio at a kitchen table. (laughs) I should take a picture of it. I might take a picture of it and put it on my Facebook page or something. But um, it's good to connect with you here. The family has gone out and they are getting... I don't know, a kitten for grandpa or something. But um, I wanted to take the time to create an episode this week. I wanted to uh, create the show instead of uh, doing something that I was thinking about doing, which was playing a repeat. I know, repeat. Nobody wants to hear a repeat. (laughs) Well, I wanted to play the repeat, and I might do this in the future, where I comment on what I talk about. So it, it might be something interesting, maybe not, I don't know. But um, I might take a subject matter from, that I talked about in the past, maybe like 100 episodes ago or so, and uh, as I'm talking on the episode, I'll interrupt and say, okay, what I was just saying there, I want to expand upon that. So that might be uh, something I do in the future. But um, at least I have an opportunity to create this episode for you instead of, I don't know, taking some time off, enjoying some of this vacation time. It's actually gorgeous right now, and I'm inside recording this, but this gives me the incentive to really enjoy my time here. And uh, just a quick little talking point and why I bring up the idea of the fact that I'm in New Hampshire is that it's amazing what happens when you leave a familiar environment and then end up somewhere else that's not so familiar. Even if it's familiar, it's not like you know where everything is in the kitchen. (laughs) When you're home, you know where everything is in the kitchen. When you cook, you know exactly where to reach for all the utensils and all the cooking utensils, everything that you use while you cook. It's all accessible. It's all easy. When you leave, it's all unfamiliar. Now, there's something good about this is that when you are doing the routine, your brain gets used to routine and it gets comfortable. When the brain's too comfortable, it doesn't learn. It remembers. It does well. It it helps to be repetitive for the brain so the brain can become, become more efficient. But it doesn't really learn anything new. Now, this may not be new information to you. Like I talked a while back, and of course, you have other sources that you probably look at regarding the brain, regarding personal growth and things like that. But I talked about um, how the brain loves novelty. The brain loves new things because it creates new neural connections, new pathways, new associations. And the more you expose yourself to new things, the smarter you get. And it's not only smarter, but the more effective you get overall with um, thought processes, with thinking things through. It's sort of like I remember when I was depressed. When I was depressed, I did routine things. I would wake up, feel depressed, go to work, feel depressed, come home, feel depressed, go to bed, feel depressed. You know, I did other things too, but overall, I felt depressed. 
and I never exposed myself to new things because I didn't want to. I mean, if you've ever been depressed, which probably most of the listening audience has has felt depression in some way, shape, or form, uh, you know how it feels where you feel like doing nothing. It is not easy to do things when you're depressed. So this is why it's important to do as many things as you can when you're not depressed. So if you get into a depressive state, your brain will have more resources, more thought processing, processing power, more associations, meaning more access to more information that might actually help you through and maybe even out of the depression. It's like preparing yourself for the bad times. When you can prepare for the bad times, then you are mentally and emotionally prepared when they come. This is what I tell coaching clients that I work with that are in a relationship that may not succeed. I help them prepare for if and when it doesn't succeed. I also help them prepare for when it does succeed, but I want them to be prepared no matter what. So let's bring this back to what I was talking about. I'm in New Hampshire. Everything's new. I'm sitting in an unfamiliar environment, although I'm getting used to it. And it's causing my brain to do different things that I wouldn't normally do if I was in the same routine at home. And this prepares me for other things. This will prepare me for other trips. This will prepare me for when I go back home and I find other processes and systems that might actually work better than what I'm doing there. And my whole point for talking about all of this is not so because I want you to be smarter, even though I do. I want you to be as smart as you possibly can be or if you even desire that. My point is that when you get away from familiar environment and put yourself in unfamiliar environment, you actually change the way you think. This is why um, I'm not too fond of the term, wherever you go, there you are, (laughs) even though I agree with it. But I don't fully agree with it because wherever you go, you're in a different environment. And if you're used to the same environment, then who you are also changes a little bit. It changes how you think. I mean, you're going to have the same beliefs and perceptions and values and things like that, but uh, those things can even change when you're in a different environment. This is why I, uh, when I was with my long-term girlfriend, I said, you know what? I want to pay for a vacation for you to get away from this house, get away from your job, get away from me, which is probably unusual, but that's what I wanted. I wanted her to have time for herself in a different environment so that she could refresh herself because this is what happens. And this might have something to do with long-term marriages too, is that a long-term marriage or any relationship for that matter, anything long-term where things are pretty much the same day after day, after day, after year, after decade, when that continues and there's no novelty, there's no change, there's no new environment, what can happen is that the brain gets so used to it, it starts to get bored. You start to get bored. And it may not be boredom. Boredom might not be the right word, but it just gets uh, the feeling that you're in a rut. It's like my girlfriend and I, for the most part, we work from home. My work with clients is over, you know, phone and Skype and things like that. Her work is remote through what she does. And we do a very similar thing day after day after day. So taking time off from that after, I don't know, the last two or three years without going anywhere is just a radical change in what we've been doing. And that radical change changes us. That radical shift in our environment where now we're staying with family and now we have to change our behavior and our processes and our systems makes us think differently. Why is that important? Why is it important to get out of routine, get out of your pattern, get out of the rut that you might be in? I'm not saying we were in a rut. I'm just saying that we were in a pattern for sure. It's important because unless you give the brain something more to do, something more to think about, some other challenge, then stagnation might kick in. And if stagnation kicks in, that could lead 
to depression, like I was just talking about. It could lead to uh, unhappiness, discomfort. So the idea is to introduce novelty, to introduce change, to radically shift something, even if just temporary. That um, vacation that I bought my first long-term girlfriend, she was out for about two days and then she said, I'm ready to come back now. And she still had a day left. And I was like, okay, if you're ready to come back, come on back. She was ready to come back. And she came back refreshed. Every time I've gone on some sort of business or pleasure trip, I've come back refreshed. And refreshed to me just means I've introduced something different to my brain. So my big picture for all this is if we want to avoid stagnation, being in a rut, the same old, same old every day, We need to introduce mini vacations. We need to introduce something that's not as familiar as everydayness, as routine, as patterns that we're in. And when we do that, we give our brain just enough so that it can be happy, so it is fed well. Feed the brain and you become happier. This doesn't mean that you read a book and learn something new. It can Absolutely. I'm all for it. And for some people, that's all they need. But I believe more in an experiential processes. I believe in getting out there, doing things. And I know that's hard for some people. We have too many kids. We don't have enough money. We can't do those things. So you do what you can. This is why some people veg out in front of the TV. (laughs) It's something new on all the time. Hey, that's new. Hey, look at that. That's new information. I want that. Hey, I feel like I'm there. Let me change the channel. Find something else. And let's not even begin talking about what you could find on the internet. Everything's on the internet. So flip, 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 change, change. Go to different websites. Go there. Go here. And suddenly your brain is overloaded. And now you have everything you ever want. And now you have a new rut of having too much. We're not going to go there. (laughs) That's just another episode, probably the ADD episode. But coming back to now, it's great to be in New Hampshire right now. We go back in a couple weeks. And I'm sure we're going to um, get right back into our routines. But the memory will be there and the new thought processing will be there. And I'm pretty sure that we will have learned something new while we are out here. Like, hmm, should we move back? (laughs) Well, probably not in this area. Internet's too slow. So that's a quick first subject of today. The next subject I'm going to talk about has to do with the perspective of the abuser. A woman named Lauren asked me to talk about that. Be right back and we'll talk about that after this. Welcome back. I'm going to really quickly mention uh, getoutofthemess.com. If you've been listening a while, you probably know that um, I talk about this legal insurance. Asha, who you've heard on the show many times, is an independent associate for Legal Shield, and she connects you with this service, which gives you access to a law firm in your state or province if you're in Canada. Uh, this is only in the U.S. or Canada, so I'm, I know this is worldwide, and I'm sorry. But U.S. and Canada, if you are looking for any type of uh, access to uh, legal guidance, This is a really, really good service. We both use it, Asha and I, and it has paid for itself over and over and over again, many, many times over. Asha has saved thousands upon thousands, especially when she's going through a divorce, because um, not only do they offer helpful guidance for like $20 to $25 a month, depending on if you're in the single or family plan, but uh, they also uh, give you a discount if you need them to represent you. These are real attorneys in real firms in your state. And they have to be quality attorneys because uh, Legal Shield just kicks them out if they're not. So <laughs> that's the way the system works. So if you're interested in getting legal guidance and uh, having what Asha likes to call this legal insurance, give her a call, 678 355 8777, or visit her website and watch a few testimonial videos at getoutofthemess.com.
Welcome back. Like I said, I was going to talk about a um, letter that I received from someone named Lauren. She said, hey, it's okay if you use my real name. I don't mind. So, all right, Lauren, this is for you. This is your letter. She said, have you ever done an episode uh, from the perspective of the abuser and how to attack that angle? I find that interesting choice of words, <laughs> Lauren. Uh, I've been doing a lot of reflecting and self-work for the past few months, and I've been trying to understand why and how I've become this person that manipulates situations for my benefit and just how I feel like I think about my own needs and not my significant others. Thank you so much for the response, and thank you for the feedback. I look forward to the episode. All right, Lauren, thank you so much for that question. This is the episode. I'll be talking about it. You know, I had to think about this one because Everything I talk about, I have to relate to in some way. I was telling someone just yesterday, I think, uh, that I can't write an article, I can't write a book unless I can relate to what I'm writing about. And um, my example is when I talked about one of my episodes, it was Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And when I researched that, you know, I had to learn all the facts. But was I truly motivated and enthused by the information that I learned. I found it interesting, but it was so hard to talk about because it was hard for me to relate to it. I mean, we all have needs and I can certainly relate to it in that way, but I just think the subject matter maybe wasn't as interesting as other things that I talk about. Because I like to talk about emotional intelligence and even though I can make some relations there, uh, it just wasn't motivating enough for me to talk about. So that was a hard episode for me to do. It was more factual. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people loved it. They are looking for data. They're looking for information. Uh, but it was a little more challenging for me to do than normal. So I've learned since then that I only talk about what I can relate to. So what I'm looking at here is how can I relate uh, to the perspective of the abuser? Now, I can relate to this from the person I used to be. Not physical abuse, but certainly emotional abuse. And, uh, well, you know what? Some small speck of physical abuse as well in my past. Not to me, but from what I did to someone else. And I'll share that in a moment. It's not what you think it is, but um, uh, it'll make sense when I start connecting dots here. So how I want to, quote, attack this angle from the abuser's uh, perspective is asking the question, why? Why does someone abuse? And I I had to sit with this for a bit and really try it on. If you've heard my show, I like to try things on, even when they're uncomfortable. I recommend that you try things on because this helps you build emotional intelligence. This helps you build regular intelligence. This helps you build empathy, which we're going to talk about in a moment as well. When you try it on, if I was that person and I did that behavior, how would I think? How would I feel? If I was that person and I liked doing abusive behavior, why would I like doing abusive behavior? And you have to try it on until you get an answer. It's very difficult sometimes. Like it's hard for me to try on the perspective of a child abuser. It's very difficult. It's hard for me to try it on, but I can get to a point where I put myself in the position of a child abuser and get to a point where I understand the reason I am abusing a child. It feels gross. I don't like doing it, but it makes me a little bit more understanding of their behavior. Not accepting, just understanding. And regardless of how much I understand, I'll probably never fully understand that perspective. But, you know, I try it on and see where I can get. So while in this state of trying on the role of an abuser, this is what I came up with. Abuse is more likely to exist when fear is present. Like, I can't think of any reason to abuse unless I fear something. For example, let's just say that I am playing the role of a child abuser and I even hate saying that term, but I'm using it because this is what we do. Sometimes we try it on and it's not comfortable, but I want to understand it. So, okay, I'm in this role of child abuser. What am I fearing? You know, I have control. I'm I'm the authority here. What am I fearing? 
Well, the child won't stop screaming. So I fear I'm losing some peace. It may not be a justifiable reason to hurt someone else, but I'm just trying this on. What, why would I feel the need to go the extra mile and hurt someone else? Well, if I can stop them from screaming, I would get my peace. If I can't stop that child from screaming, then I fear I'll lose my peace. And without peace, I feel uncomfortable. Now, that's very simplified, and a lot of this will be simplified, but just follow along, and there are some dots I'll be connecting here. So there's that one component. Uh, Abuse is more likely to exist when there is a lack of empathy. Not a lack of empathy for the person in general, but for your behavior toward the person. So here I am, uh, kids screaming, and I know that if I smack him on the butt, uh, he's going to cry some more, but at least he'll learn his lesson. And then maybe I'll get some peace. Now, I must have to give up some empathy if I have it. I mean, some people don't have as much empathy as others, but let's just say that I normally have empathy. But in this uh, state of mind where I fear I'm losing some peace, I might have to give up some empathy in order to hit this child. And what I mean by empathy in this case is that If I were to put myself in the child's perspective and try that on, then I would have empathy. Because as a child, I don't want to get hit. I'm just hungry or I'm just bored or I can't express myself so I just scream. When I put myself in the child's perspective, in the child's role, then I can feel empathy. If I refuse to do that, that's when abuse is more likely to exist. So there's another component. Next one is, Abuse uh, can exist when there is little or no accountability. If I hit this child and no one sees me do it, there's no accountability. So I'm more likely to go in that direction. I mean, this is if you already have a propensity to abuse. I mean, that's a whole other issue. Maybe you were brought up being abused. Maybe you were brought up uh, thinking it's okay to hit other people. But again, just for simplicity, let's just go through these uh, components and see where we get. Uh, So if there's little or no accountability, uh, the abuser is more likely to follow through with it. The next one is the more power one has, the more comfortable they are. What does that mean? That's uh, that's talking about um, physical, mental, and financial power. If you're physically more powerful than someone else, if you're financially more powerful, meaning you have more money, which gives you more options, which gives you more uh, choices to control others with money. Emotionally speaking, if you lack empathy, uh, I wouldn't call that emotional power, but I would certainly say it is dominating. If you lack empathy, you can be dominating over over others and let your ego drive the bus, so to speak. So the more power you have, the more comfortable you are. If I have power over you, that makes me more comfortable. I'm just trying it on. (laughs) Uh, The more comfortable you are, the more you want to keep that comfort. So imagine someone who has the propensity to abuse. And I'm talking about any type of abuse. Emotional, physical, sexual, anything. Although the sexual abuse is kind of um, an extreme. But uh, we'll, we'll include that in this mix as well. But the more comfortable you are, the more you want to keep that comfort. You can even say the more comfortable you aren't, the more you want to get that comfort. So that's part of this machine that we're building inside that if we are an abuser, these are the components that make us do that abuse because a lot of people use their power to keep their comfort. And some people use that power uh, ethically, morally, and some people don't. Some people abuse others to keep that comfort. Again, showing that lack of empathy. I'm going to put all this together in a moment, so if this is kind of confusing, believe me, I'm going somewhere. But let me talk about the the sexual abuse part for a moment. What about sexual abuse? A lot of people say rape and other forms of sexual abuse is about power. Now, I don't disagree with that, but my belief is that it is about power, but uh, indirectly or maybe in parallel, it's not only about power. In my view, healthy sex between consenting people is enjoyable and maybe even what you might call comfortable. So we go back to some people abuse to keep their own comfort. 
or to get comfort. So when you take the subject of sex, because it feels good, if you have that abusive propensity, you might take sex forcibly because feeling good is the goal. And if you have power, you can do that. You shouldn't do that. But people do sometimes take sex forcibly, which almost always alters the other person forever. Again, stemming from that lack of empathy. Because if you were to put yourself into the person that was being sexually abused, if you were to try that on and be the victim, then you would feel empathy. And you most likely wouldn't abuse. So let me say this. Let me go back to abuse in a nutshell. You could say that uh, if you have the propensity to abuse and you want to feel good and comfortable, you'll do whatever you can to have or get that good, comfortable feeling. I've not, I haven't heard too many cases where people want to feel bad so they abuse. Though even in those cases, uh, the bad feeling for them can feel good overall, almost like self-harming, except they are harming someone else to feel bad themselves. But even going down that road, self-harming is still a way to feel better than you feel. It doesn't work because it's a vicious cycle that never ends until you get the strength and support to end it because it's very temporary. So if you're a self-harmer, it never ends until you stop it. So what you need to do is stop it and figure out something else because self-harming is a vicious cycle that just continues and continues and it hurts. But that hurt almost feels good as if you're alive. But because you're self-harming, you feel bad again and so on and so on. But we'll talk about that some other time. But no matter what, no one wins in an abuse scenario. The abuser can feel good and comfortable by abusing, but they typically wrestle with an equal amount of bad and uncomfortable feelings. In other words, if they didn't feel bad, they probably would never get to the point of abusing someone else. Because why would you abuse someone else if you feel okay or uh, you weren't feeling so bad? There's got to be something going on inside of you that feels bad enough to abuse someone else. If you don't ever feel bad enough, you may not ever abuse. There's some gray areas I know I'm touching on here, but um, I'm going to wrap it up here momentarily. But let me tell you a little story. When I said there was a touch of physical abuse in my past, and again, this is not necessarily what you may think, but it does give me the perception of the abusive parent that really goes off on their kid, really, you know, does some sort of physical abuse. And the example I used, you know, the kid's crying and crying and crying, and I, playing this role as the abuser, just want the kid to shut up. So, you know, I physically abuse. And of course, that makes them cry more. But now I'm trying to give them accountability. If they cry, they're going to hurt more, which really... I hate to say it screws up the kid with this traumatic bonding that I mentioned before where there's an equal amount of abuse and love and abuse and love and they're not sure what's supposed to feel good and feeling bad is um, not allowed and it can be pretty ugly uh, depending on what's going on in the, the situation. But my story is just a tiny one. When I worked in this um, surf shop in my 20s, there was this young kid that always came in, hung around, uh, didn't have anything else to do, and he was okay. He kind of bothered me sometimes, but he was mostly passive and just liked to talk when no one else was there, and I just allowed it to happen. But um, he was doing something. He was really bothering me this one time, and he wouldn't shut up about it, <laughs> and he just kept talking and repeating things and talking, and I think he was like, I don't know, messing with the displays or something that, that was making my life harder at least the way I perceived it back then. He kept doing whatever it was over and over and over again. And I said, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Now, remember, I'm in my 20s. This kid's like, I don't know, 13. I said, you better stop it right now. And he did it one more time. I ran over, knocked him down, locked him under my legs, and said, I told you to stop it, and you're going to stop it now. And there he was. His eyes were wide. He was in frozen fear. He had no idea what I was going to do. And I said, all right. And he shook his head. And he's like, yes, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I got up, got off of him. And I said, thank you. 
and I walk back to the register. Now, that could be seen as physical abuse. That could be seen as me losing it. It's that crying kid. I lost it, and I made it stop, and it was inappropriate. I shouldn't have done it. It worked, and I kept my cool. I didn't hit him. I just pushed him down and held him down and told him to stop it. But that taught me something that day. That taught me that I am absolutely capable of getting to that tipping point, that threshold where I could go over the edge. Now, fortunately for me, my toleration level has grown way beyond what it used to be. I used to be a lot more uh, unbalanced, you could say, and my tipping point was a lot lower, but now it's so much higher and I have different resources, different tools. If I ever get to the point where I get so angry and I can't control the situation, I'm still not losing it like I did that time. Now, the reason I mention this story is because some people don't have that much resilience or tolerance. Some people don't have such a high tipping point. Some people have such little tolerance that abusing someone else is the only way they can think of to get their needs met. Somebody else might have given him one chance I said, stop it, and then they run over and smack him in the face and push him down. That could happen with someone else who doesn't have the toleration, the resilience, or maybe the upbringing that other people have had. There's a whole complex series of um, events going on inside the head that can raise their propensity to abuse or lower it. And I think I have a somewhat incomplete but um, interesting formula for an abusive person if you want to hear it. And you have no choice because I'm going to tell you right now. (laughs) My formula for the abuser, and again, this is very simple. This is not fully fleshed out, but uh, let's go with it. It is um, one, feeling bad. So there's something in the abuser that feels bad and they don't like it. Number two is um, they have little empathy. So the person that is their potential victim for abuse, they cannot put themselves in their position to the point where they feel full empathy for them. The next thing is low toleration. So if the abuser has a low toleration level, low resilience to behavior they disagree with, that's part of it. Uh, Another one is low self-control. If the person who has the propensity to abuse has low self-control, This is also part of that formula. Another one is power, mental, physical, and financial power. If they have any of that, that gives them more of the inclination to abuse. Another one is no accountability. If no one's looking, if they know they won't get in trouble, that adds to the potential for abuse. And the last one, at least one I'm going to talk about in this episode, is fear. There has to be some sort of fear inside the person who has the inclination to abuse in order for them to get to a point where they need to abuse. That formula, feeling bad plus little empathy plus low toleration plus low self-control plus power plus no accountability plus fear can lead to abusing someone else. The reason I gave you that in a list is if you're writing this stuff down and you're assessing yourself, then I want you to go through these things and figure out where you are in this scale or whatever you want to call it. And I know there's more to this. There's a lot more. There's history of the person who has the inclination to abuse. There are circumstances that um, you can only take so much no matter how high your toleration level is. I'm not saying that gives you permission to abuse. I'm just saying that uh, these are all factors. And um, I will say this before I end this segment, that um, when I was in my marriage, I was self-admittedly, at least in hindsight, emotionally abusive to my wife. I absolutely made her feel bad. I emotionally withdrew. I would give her the silent treatment. I would make her feel bad for what she ate. I would make her feel bad for not working. I would make her feel bad for a lot of things. Instead of addressing things directly, communicating with her openly. I would give her the look. I would make her feel bad in subtle ways. I would be passive aggressive. I would say things and do things that I knew would upset her, but make it look like she was the guilty one and make her feel guilty about it. 
That's why I was so good at writing this uh, mean workbook, the manipulation and emotional abuse workbook, because I did a lot of the things to emotionally abuse someone. I'm not proud of it. I absolutely feel bad for putting her through that, especially because I know she deserved better. Again, all in hindsight, I can look at this and go, geez, I can't believe I did this to her. I feel bad about that. But I'm so glad I learned so much and I was able to heal from so much. And she got away from me so that she could heal and find someone else that was more healthy for her. And because of our separation, we, be, we both became healthier. And I learned a lot more about emotional abuse. And I've been able to help others with it. So I created this uh, checklist that helps you identify if you're in an emotionally abusive relationship which uh, you can check out if you want, theoverwhelmedbrain.com. Just look, you'll see a little banner there that says, uh, is your partner manipulating you or something like that? And you take the mean test, M-E-A-N. Anyway, when I was married, I had all of these, I guess you could call symptoms. I felt bad. I wanted to feel better. Uh, I couldn't have had too much empathy for my wife because I certainly did things that made her feel bad. I had a low toleration for the things that she was doing I had low self-control, otherwise I would have not did the behavior that caused her to feel bad. I had power because I was bringing home more money and, quote, I'm not the one with the eating disorder. You know, that gives me power when I think in those terms. What accountability did I have? I didn't even know there was accountability because she never threatened me with divorce. She never did anything that made me think that she would ever leave. So I thought, hey, I'm home free. I could just... Uh, abuse all I want. Again, I didn't use that word abuse back then. I was just doing bad behavior that I didn't realize I was doing. And then of course I had fear because if I didn't say anything, then I might end up with a woman that I'm not attracted to anymore and other things. And I, and I carried all this fear with me through our marriage and I allowed all of that to motivate me to do bad behavior, to be emotionally abusive. So Lauren, I hope Uh, This answers your question from the perspective of the abuser. I certainly don't have a uh, deeper perspective from people who do severe abuse. That uh, in itself is a whole nother ball of wax, I guess. And I hate knowing that it uh, exists in the world. I have become a different person in the last 20 years. That person is someone that I don't ever want to be again. In fact, my, um, if my girlfriend ever points that out, she goes, you know what you're doing? You're manipulating me. <laughs> I have to stop and go, okay, I got to take a step back and figure out if she's right. Because what happens often is that the manipulator, the emotional abuser goes into some sort of unconscious state and they may not even be aware that they're doing it. This can happen. This is something else I talk about in the mean workbook. They can be unconscious of their own behavior and not realize how it's affecting their partner. So when my girlfriend today says, hey, what you're doing is manipulating me. She's only said it like twice, I think. Uh, I'll go, what? No, I'm not. Of course, you have to deny it first. (laughs) And uh, what I do is then go, wait, is she right? I better check in with myself. Always check in with yourself because you may not be aware what you're doing to someone else. And I think the most powerful, most healing thing you can do for yourself is to put yourself in the other person's shoes. If they treated me like I am treating them, how would that feel to me? And you might say, well, it would feel, I I would want the answers. I would want the solutions. I would want to be guided. If you have that come up for your answer, then you're probably wrong (laughs) because you have not been in their shoes the length of time they have been in their shoes. So empathy involves really imagining what it's like growing up from their child and from their perspective with their parents, with their influences, with everything that's happened in their life to get to the point where they are now with you or around you and dealing with the behavior from you. How do you process that if you were them? I think empathy is a huge component to stop abuse along with accountability, but um, hopefully that's not all that drives you. Empathy, when it drives you, is very powerful because it changes who you are, changes like your uh, makeup of who you are. If you can be empathetic toward almost anyone, 
then it's not about um, getting away with anything. It's about actually feeling for someone else, having an emotional response that's similar to theirs so that you can go, wow, if I was them, that wouldn't feel very good. What I just said wouldn't feel very good. That's a great place to be, and I hope uh, everyone listening is there. If you're not, work on it. I'll be right back. All right, welcome back. I'm going to read you an email from someone I'm going to call Mary. Mary writes, I recently found your podcast and I'm excited to catch up on your episodes. I've been in a real depressive, anxious state in the past couple of months. I have a lot going on with my family, my mom. Most of them are dysfunctional and financially dependent upon each other. Uh, I don't like my job. I'm trying to find a way out of that. And what I'd like is advice from you regarding my relationship. I'm with a man that's just like me. I'm very anxious and he can relate. We're both on a path of self-growth and talk to each other about everything. It's still new about seven months and a part of me sees a future with this person. There is this other part that mentally harasses me and says that we shouldn't be together. It's not going to work, so we might as well end it now before we invest the time and it hurts down the road. I think about it all the time. I don't know why, but my brain is obsessed on figuring it out. I want to focus on bettering myself, but the relationship keeps popping in my mind. It got to the point where my thoughts were so loud and my feelings so intense that I did break up with him. We're now in a place that we're still doing things that couples do, but without the label. I'm just afraid that those intense thoughts and feelings will come back. It's like PTSD. When I'm triggered, it starts the cycle. I think it'll be easier just to end it and not deal with these feelings. I know I'll get over it, but I don't know if this will be a pattern in my life, and I really like this guy. Thank you for your time. It felt nice just writing this down. Please provide any advice at your earliest convenience. I'm not looking for you to to make a decision for me. I guess I would like to feel or know that I'm not the only one who's going through this. Many thanks, Mary. All right, Mary, you are not the only one going through this. I know there are people nodding their heads listening to this right now. And, um, you know, I've, I've felt the same way, not in relationships. I mean, I've done it with other things in life, but, um, certainly you're definitely not the only one. And, uh, you know, thanks for sharing all this, too, because, like you said, it feels better just writing it down. That's uh, something I'm going to reiterate every time someone says that, because it is so important to write down what the challenges are in your life. You know, this is what's happening in my life right now. I feel X, and it makes me do Y, and every night I think of Z, and, you know, you just write down everything that uh, is a problem in your life. So you can articulate it because our brain works so fast that it uh, often overlooks what the real problems are in our life. Because there's a difference between saying, oh, I'm feeling sad. And then writing down going, I feel sad today because I stubbed my toe and it made me hurt, which, you know, (laughs) you just keep writing and writing. And what will happen is that You're slowing down your brain processes to do some self-reflection at a speed that will actually reveal things when you write them down. And it's also a way to express and get this feeling that's inside out of you by expressing it. When you express it, that is sometimes releasing. Oftentimes, it feels releasing. It feels liberating. So what Mary's saying here is that, uh, you know, it feels better to write it down. It doesn't mean her problem solved, but it just feels better to do it. And my belief is half the battle is expressing what's truly going on inside of you. And uh, when you release it, you traveled half the path to get to a place of feeling better. It doesn't always work out that way, but absolutely expressing is part of the process. So Mary, I'm going to address this in a way that asks you questions and gives you maybe a metaphor to think about. Because I felt this way in the past when it came to uh, weekends. <laughs> um, I would um, approach a weekend and think, well, why bother enjoying the weekend? Because Monday's right around the corner. And it's sort of along the same lines, right? Why bother enjoying my time today 
when I know my time tomorrow is going to or may suck, <laughs> to, to put it bluntly. Why bother enjoying it? So I get it. I get the idea that why bother investing in something today if it just could be a failure tomorrow. I get the idea. It's That idea has its flaws, thankfully, <laughs> because we would never be able to get anywhere if we thought, well, if it fails tomorrow, why bother doing anything today? That's like a Homer Simpson. He goes, you probably won't succeed, so why try? <laughs> he said something like that. Uh, that's a real downer because it doesn't give you much to look forward to. One of the problems is that we're always looking forward instead of being present, being in the moment. Like when the weekend came, uh, I, was, I would enjoy my Saturday, but I wouldn't enjoy my Sunday because I knew Monday was coming and it was hard to appreciate things in the moment. So, you know, you learn presence. You know, Eckhart Tolle teaches presence. And if you watch or listen to him, you can find him on YouTube. He will teach you how to be present so that you're not always thinking about tomorrow. I'm not saying that's my answer to you. I'm just saying that is an answer, uh, a path that I would recommend you take if you're always so concerned about the future. Because if you are not practicing presence, you are missing out on everything that happens in life. Because nothing ever happens tomorrow. Nothing. It all happens today. <laughs> it all happens right now. This is it. This is all you got right now. So thinking about tomorrow is kind of a waste of time. I'm not saying you don't plan. I'm not saying you don't uh, save for retirement. None of that stuff. I'm saying that worries cause you to fail being in the present moment. Worries and anxiety about things that haven't happened, probably won't happen, or may happen, but aren't happening now, can really mess up some good times in your life. So I want you to plant that seed way in the back of your unconscious mind while I give you some uh, food for thought. One of those pieces of food is a question. I want you to think about your relationship with this guy and ask yourself this question. What's one thing you would change about him that would make you not have these thoughts? I mean, that's a simple question, right? What's one thing that you would change about him that would change your thoughts? Is there anything? There may not be. But the reason I ask you that is because I want to make sure that you have considered that it's not your subconscious mind warning you about something about this guy. Like, I don't like the way he tells me what to do. Because if you sweep that under the rug and everything else is great about him, then you may have thoughts that this relationship's not going to work out. So why bother investing in something when there's something about him that you, that you really don't like and will probably amplify as time goes on, or at least in intensity and in how you feel about it? So that's important. What's one thing that you would change about him that would make you not have these thoughts? If there is something, then that's what you should focus on. Not the idea that you're wasting time in investing in the relationship, but that's what you need to focus on. You might need to talk about it with him. You, may need, you might need to resolve that in yourself. There might need to be some healing there. But if there's nothing that you can see that is a big red flag, let me ask you another question. And this might be a tough one. Let's just say that you knew he was going to die in three months. Does that mean you dump him now so that you wouldn't have to feel the pain of losing someone you love? That may not be easy to answer, but um, if you knew he was going to die in three months, there's an expiration. Does that mean you'd break up with him now so you wouldn't have to feel the pain in three months? I don't have an answer. I'm just throwing these at you, give you some different perspectives. Let me give you a less morbid example. Let's just say that you have the option of enjoying a delicious meal today, but you found out that tomorrow you're going to have an awful meal. Would you throw out today's delicious meal because tomorrow is going to be a big waste of time? I want you to think about that one because if someone handed you the most delicious food and you're hungry and you want it, are you going to look at it and go, well, why bother enjoying it if tomorrow I'm just going to have a donut? Well, that might be delicious too, but let's just say that it's something you don't like. Tomorrow, I'm just going to have dirt. Tomorrow, I'm going to have liver and onions or whatever you don't like. 
anchovies. <laughs> I'm projecting here. Well, let's just say that that's what it was. Like for me, it'd be like, oh, somebody put pizza in front of me. But tomorrow, we're going to eat rice and beans. All right, that's okay. But ugh, I can't enjoy this pizza because tomorrow we're going to have rice and beans. Blah. Personally, when I try that on, I go, pizza? <laughs> I'm all about it. I am present. I am there. I'm enjoying it. It doesn't matter what tomorrow brings. Today, I'm eating pizza. I mean, that's one of the foods that I really enjoy. Today, I'm eating pizza. My thoughts aren't going to what I'm going to eat tomorrow. They're right there, then and now. Is this what you do? Is it? Can you look at a food that you love and not love it because tomorrow you're, not, you're going to have a food that you don't love? I don't think many people do that. I think they're enjoying what they have in the moment. That's how I see relationships. When I'm with my girlfriend, I know that any day she could grow tired of me. She could, I don't know, kick me out. <laughs> she could say, take a hike, buddy. Uh, you're not who I want anymore. I don't think it'll be that cold, but I certainly don't let that motivate me from what is going on today. What's going on today is what I focus on. This is why I say it's so important for you to know that what you have today is what you want. Is what you have today what you want? Let's just say that tomorrow doesn't exist. Let's just say there's going to be some planetary cataclysm and no one's going to be here. The person you're spending today with, is that who you want in your life? Because if the answer is, no, I, I don't want to be with that person, then you're probably right. Investing your time and energy into a person that you don't want to be with it might be a waste of time. And these fears that are coming up are probably subconscious or instinctual and telling you, hey, you need to get out of this or, or something. But thinking in these terms where there is no tomorrow really puts you into the present moment. And all you have to judge and discern and decide about stands in front of you today. And how do you know if this is right for you today? I look at patterns and trends. I look at the trend with my girlfriend and the patterns in our life. Are the patterns healthy? Are the trends always rising for the better? You know, the chart on the wall that shows the company profit. You hopefully see a line that goes up, 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 a little down, up, 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 and a little down, up, 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 as it goes to the right. That is a good rising trend. And then maybe it'll get to the peak and then you'll level off and it feels pretty good up there. Hey, we're making profits. People love us. We're, you know, changing the world, whatever. I like to see that in the relationship too. If I see that rising trend, then I know that this is how it is and this is how it will be. Because up till today, this is how it's been. So I have nothing else to go on but this trend. But if that hasn't been the trend in your relationship and it's been going down, leveling, going down, leveling, or just nothing but going down, then that's most likely what's going to happen in the future. Unless something big happens, nothing is going to change. When you rely on, I hope things change, they usually don't. At least in the trend category here. If I'm talking about trending and it's going down, down, and down, that's likely what's going to happen. You look at the past six years, the past six months, the past six weeks, does the trend keep lowering and lowering? If yes, then of course tomorrow looks dismal. Of course, six months from now, feels like you're going to break up anyway. So why bother? That's important. It's important to understand where you are in this trend, what's going on. Now, let me give you a third, maybe less than pleasant analogy. What if you had to swim underwater for, say, 45 seconds? You know that to prepare to swim for that amount of time, you probably want to breathe deeply to get as much oxygen into your lungs and bloodstream as possible so that you didn't run out of breath too soon. So before you jumped in the water, would you tell yourself, what's the point? In the next 45 seconds, I'm not going to be able to breathe anyway. So I might as well just stop breathing now, way before I get into the water. After all, breathing won't be an option. Because once you jump in the water, you can't breathe. So why bother breathing today? I know that's a silly analogy, but I want you to think in these terms that maybe it is silly to think like you're thinking. I mean, if the trend is okay, if the trend is rising or steady. 
It's like looking at water going, well, I have to go underwater, but why bother breathing at all since I won't have the option to breathe when I'm underwater, so I might as well just stop now. If that doesn't make sense, it's meant to not really make sense because it looks at the futility of stopping breathing. It's sort of futile to stop breathing before you jump in the water. It's actually, you want to breathe as much as you can to oxygenate yourself before you go underwater. The more you oxygenate, the longer you can hold your breath. But if your attitude is, well, it's ridiculous. I'm not going to be able to breathe anyway, so I might as well stop breathing now. It's like saying, well, it's ridiculous. I'm not going to have a relationship with this person in six months, or at least I fear that it'll, it'll fail in some way. So why bother enjoying it today? It's like you're turning off your ability to enjoy today because you don't believe you'll enjoy tomorrow. But I'd hope you would enjoy a meal today or think of something else. If you're on a roller coaster, (laughs) would you enjoy a roller coaster today? Or would you think, well, I'm not going to be on it tomorrow, so why bother enjoying it today? I don't think life is supposed to work that way. I think as we've gotten more intelligent as human beings, we have created future worry. We have created future memories that haven't happened, if that makes sense. Tomorrow's memory is going to be resentment, (laughs) regret. Tomorrow's memory is going to be this, this, and this. Today it hasn't happened yet, but tomorrow I have a feeling it'll happen. Except we're so smart we can actually put these memories in the future and they haven't even happened yet. Ouch, that's not healthy, that's not fun, that's not a way to live life. Like I've said in my uh, past episodes, I've often meditated on the idea that tomorrow's not going to happen. It can be hard to do that because, oh no, what if tomorrow never happens, what, uh, what does that mean? Well, I like to think about what would I do today? You know, live like it's your last day on earth. I'm not saying do that because you'll get into debt. You'll do things that are probably a little too crazy. So don't necessarily do that. But certainly build the appreciation for what it's like to live this last day with the people that are closest to you in your life. Who would you call? What would you say to people? And then when you meditate on that, you really get some perspective on what's most important. So Mary, I'm going to leave you with that, and uh, I hope this helps in some way, shape, or form. Um, Listen to my uh, anxiety episodes, because you mentioned you both have anxiety, so I want you to uh, start the healing process from that, too. I know it's not an easy thing to heal from, but there is healing with that. That can happen, and I want you to heal. I want you to get to a better place. Thank you so much for writing. Thanks for listening to the show. We'll be right back. Say some thank yous, my final words, and goodbye after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank Banditsu. I think that's how you say it. Banditsu gave The Overwhelmed Brain five stars in iTunes, and he or she said that uh, almost every week Paul says something that just clicks. Makes me wonder why I didn't think about that before. They said, I went through some troubled times a couple of years ago and started listening to several self-help podcasts. The Overwhelmed Brain is the only one that I still listen to. Thank you, Banditsu. I appreciate you. And thanks for anyone who leaves a review for... Uh, a book I wrote or the podcast, I'll happily call you out on the air. (laughs) If you've left a review and I haven't mentioned it, let me know. I want to hear from you. Just go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com and click on the contact button. Thank you again, Benditsu. And I want to thank today's sponsor, getoutofthemess.com. Call Asha, ask her questions. She's not going to sell you on it. She just wants to make sure it's right for you and let you know if you even need it. 678-355-8777. And I mentioned it in the first segment about abuse. Find out if you're being manipulated or emotionally abused in your relationship by getting the mean workbook. Go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash mean. The manipulation and emotional abuse assessment tool for guidance and healing. And I I have to say something uh, on a personal level. I actually feel sort of sad that people get this workbook because that probably means they are in an emotionally abusive relationship. So every time I see uh, someone purchasing it, I feel kind of bad. But at the same time, I feel really good knowing that this tool will help them. This tool will help you. 
If you often feel like you're blamed or made to feel responsible for most, if not all the problems in your relationship, if you feel like you're walking on eggshells, if you find that you have to pick your words carefully so you won't upset your partner, or maybe you just don't know how to make your partner happy, or maybe you're always feeling guilty when you shouldn't have to, check out the Mean Workbook, theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash mean. And I want to thank members of the patron program for continuing to support this show. If you're a patron member, I appreciate you. You are supporting what I would call the cause, (laughs) the cause, the movement, the path to helping the world become more, I don't know, empowered. I want the world to become empowered so that they can make decisions that are right for them. I want you to be empowered so that you can make decisions that are right for you. I mean, imagine having all your friends and family feel comfortable in their own skin, feel like they can make decisions that will benefit them and everyone else around them. Imagine being in a world without dysfunction. I don't know if that's possible, but imagine it. (laughs) That should be part of the song. Imagine there's no dysfunction. Uh, (laughs) And if you want the world to become less dysfunctional, then turn people on to this show. Turn people on to shows like this, to material like this, if they want. I mean, some people don't want this material. Some people will think, hey, stop trying to help me. I'm I'm not asking for your help. But, you know, if you have their phone in your hand, you can just subscribe to The Overwhelmed Brain without them knowing. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm just saying, imagine doing that. (laughs) Anyway, thank you to you for listening to the show. Thank you for the patron members for supporting this show. Thank you for those of you using the Amazon link on the website and the donate button on the website. You are absolutely ultra valuable. I appreciate you for doing that. And of course, if you want to join the patron program, you can get private episodes, workbooks, and um, even email coaching with me. Go to patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. And finally, thank you to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. And I'd like to close the show with one question. Just a single question for you. What is one thing you've always wanted to do that uh, you haven't done yet? Sort of a bucket list question. What's on your bucket list? But I don't want it to be that deep because the bucket list is is sort of overwhelming. Like, I got to do this and this and this and this and this. Oh, before I die, okay. What is one thing in your life that uh, maybe you can do, but you haven't done yet? The reason I ask is because if we really were to treat today as the last day, uh, then we think about all the stuff that um, we haven't done. I'm not saying that you have to go out and do it. I'm not saying that it is something that uh, you need to do. Like Your bucket list isn't something you need to do. It's something you want to do. Or some people might treat it as they need to do it. But I like to look at my bucket list as things that I want to do, things that I want to experience Uh, before my time is up. But what can I do today? I know that's the most practical, personal growth question you'll ever face. It's like, all right, uh, just get out there and do it. Just get out there and start reading about it. Move forward in that direction so that it can start the process. Reminds me of a a client that I have that um, is really stuck. She's in a stuck place. She's in a place that she doesn't want to live family is not necessarily uh, helpful or wanting to be around her and it's really tough for her she's not happy and she regrets you know some of the decisions that she's made and when I talk with her you know I'm reminding her that uh, these things are all temporary it's kind of a sad thought (laughs) everything's temporary but it's also a happy thought because Even the bad stuff in life is almost always temporary. Oh, I live in this crappy house in this crappy town with this crappy job. But it's temporary. I don't know a single person who's held a job forever. (laughs) I don't know anyone who's had the same job forever. Even the people that uh, spent 40 years in the same position eventually retired. I'm not saying that you have to spend that long because nowadays uh, jobs are different. Jobs aren't so focused on longevity. They're they're focused on efficiency and trying to not pay workers as much as maybe they deserve. And but regardless of that, I mean, not even jobs, just the people that you're with. Like I had um, 
another client, an email coaching client that wrote in and she's very young and she had this wonderful relationship with this person and um, she's not sure if she should end it or, or not and you know the person might be seeing someone else and there's all kinds of things going on and she thanked me for the reminder that she is young and there's a whole lifetime ahead of her. And I appreciated that she thanked me. She actually recognized that, oh, yeah, wait, I am young. It's just so much has happened in my life that I felt like I've been through it all. You haven't been through it all. No one's been through it all. There's more to come. I know that sounds scary too, (laughs) but there's more good to come. If you're in a bad situation, it is temporary. It is. I know you feel like it's going to last forever, and maybe it feels like it has lasted forever, but everything has changed. Everything shifts everything is in movement the people that you're with now will change they will move they may stick around a while they may leave they may i hate to say die they may do a number of things and the today that's not so good brings a better tomorrow it's like the opposite of what i was talking about earlier enjoy today enjoy the present moment well if you're not enjoying the present moment then think of the temporariness of The bad in your life, the not so good, if you want to call it something else, the um, unpleasant, the uncomfortableness in your life, it's temporary. Now, if you are in maybe a debilitating position where maybe you're handicapped, maybe you need to be cared for 24-7, maybe there's something else going on in your life, it's still temporary. It may last you your whole life and you may have to come to a level of acceptance that you don't want to accept. But if you do come to this level of acceptance that this is the way life has to be, then maybe there is some solace in the present moment. But it's still temporary. We're all here temporarily. I know that's somewhat of a morbid fact. I know that somewhat that uh, reminds us that no matter what we do, death is imminent. I plan on downloading my consciousness to a computer. (laughs) It's what I do every week. It's the podcast that you're listening to now. But uh, I don't think I'm going to be alive after I'm dead. I think my words will be alive. But if I can, I'm going to do it. I'm going to install my consciousness into some supercomputer. That's a fantasy, of course. But it sounds kind of fun. We'll see what happens. But the idea is that um, the terrible stuff that happens in your life is terrible temporarily and then something else happens some shift in life people change people move on you change you move on and yes there is death let's just say it bluntly there is death and it hurts and it's terrible and then we move on from that too things change i i look at every relationship in my past and go This is the person I'm going to be with forever. And then she leaves. And then the next person, this is the person I'm going to be with forever. And then she left. And that happened several times in my life. And it's probably happened several times in your life. This is the person. This is the job I'm going to keep forever. This is the house I'm going to live in forever. This is the view I'm going to have forever. And then things change. And like I said, I don't mean that to sound like a bad thing. I like the idea of change even though good stuff changes too. Because if there was no change, then the bad stuff wouldn't change. So I kind of like the idea that there is change even though the good stuff can change too. The idea behind what I teach is to become accepting internally of these changes and being the empowered, resilient person person you need to be to shift through all these changes to adapt and evolve from dysfunction and all the bad stuff that comes into your life to be mentally and emotionally prepared for what life has to offer us so that way when the bad stuff does happen we aren't so debilitated and uh, as time goes on the debilitation period if you want to call it that or the time of feeling down becomes shorter and shorter and shorter the frequency happens less often the duration happens less often and the duration of the good times goes longer and the frequency of the good times happen more often that's the idea 
we're shifting into that space where we can make more good times and make them last longer by learning all the stuff that we can learn on this journey, by improving ourselves, by evolving. You know, we learn, heal, grow, and evolve to the point where we're so resilient and empowered that soon we don't see everything as bad. We just see it as the next temporary thing to get to a better place. There might be some spirituality thrown in there. Maybe for some of you there might be religion and uh, maybe there's other things in that mix, but that's my big picture. And if you like my big picture, then all I ask is that you keep an open mind and step into your power and be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing. <music>